It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to um, all the people who put this event together, including Roger, and I forget all the names, Kim, um, and uh, well, all the people that Roger just mentioned. Um, so a big thank you to them. Um, it's been quite an interesting ride along the way, um, having been moved from one venue to another for all sorts of interesting reasons. Um, and uh, I nearly didn't get there this morning, which is quite interesting, just southwest train, that was all. But uh, I did, so that's, that's fine. So, my name is William. Um, if you haven't seen, there's no reason why you should. Any of um, my interviews online, um, I'm going to be talking about constitutional law. Um, and the reason why I'm talking about constitutional law, particularly at the moment, as many of you will know, is that right now it's probably the best way to hold the powers that be's feet to the fire. Because um, the Constitution is a real thing, uh, it is the real deal, and uh, when they are held to it, all kinds of interesting things I suspect will happen. The problem is, is that it just hasn't happened, that holding of their feet to the fire in sufficient weight, um, because largely we've had it educated out of us that perhaps there isn't even, even is a, a constitution. So I'm going to put some, um, some clarity, I think, I hope anyway, um, on the subject of constitutional law. Um, a little bit about me, I'll just move on. Um, okay, that's exciting. Okay. Oh, that's the first issue. Yeah. Technical problems, obviously. Okay, so who am I and what am I trying to do? So, as I mentioned, my name is William, William Keats. Um, back in the conventional days, when I didn't have sort of uh, didn't, didn't have hidden knowledge about things um, like many of you do, um, I was a teacher. Um, and uh, I went into, into teaching all age groups um, originally, actually. Um, initially, uh, music, um, I taught music, and, uh, and then later technology, um, and in what we used to call information and communications technology in schools. Um, and since then, I've been in business, uh, in industry, uh, writing database systems for schools, uh, largely, um, and my circumstances changed uh, around about Christmas time which enabled me to put a lot more time into this. Uh, and my, my interest on the side uh, has been for quite a while constitutional law. Um, how did I sort of come to, to realize that, that many things were not right in the world? Because the way that we uh, start to understand information through schools and universities, um, we, we, we very soon, after a, after a while, realise that something's not quite right because a lot of that information doesn't quite stack up when you start uh, putting the dots together. Uh, and for me, that was around 2006, six, seven, um, and I started to look quite deeply at the pharma pharmaceutical industry at the time and the history behind it. Um, the Rockefeller Institute, the Carnegie Foundation, um, and the history behind um, medicine. Um, along with a lot of other things as well. And that led me into um, the interest of geopolitics um, and the broad brush political games across the world that are played, not within nations, but across broad nations across the world, the big games, um, how wars are set up, um, that kind of thing. So looked at quite deeply at the Bolshevik Revolution and how um, events led gradually into the First World War and then the Second World War, um, and how uh, our governments using nudging techniques, psychological nudging, messaging, all sorts of uh, interesting effects um, and methods that I'm sure you're aware of, uh, go into internations and create um, instability um, through information, information wars. So I was looking at that a lot, um, and then realised that a lot of these things, uh, including you know whether it's uh, cloud seeding technologies or um, whatever, whatever it might be that you look at, uh, I realised that all of these were symptoms. Um, and what I really wanted to do was um, get to the bottom of the cause. It's not really a cause, actually, law, but it's the, it's the pinch point. It's the point at which all of these symptoms come together. And so I realised that actually, unless we look at law and overreach of government, 
Um, it, actually, we're not really going to solve any of these things at all, because if you look at all of these problems, whichever one you're interested in, really, they're all about overreach and um, overreach of government, and they, they're just wildly outside where they should be. So that's what I started looking at, and I realised that actually all of this was about constitutional law. So that's what I'm about. Um, that's the boring bit, that way. <laughs> so something's not right. <clears throat> Uh, our reality is not how we've been taught, as I've already uh, mentioned, um, and we are enslaved by a consensus. Okay, so what is that consensus? It's the sincere belief and the support of the status quo in those around us. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what we do, because ultimately the numbers matter, unfortunately because that's the consensus. That's the, the reality that we are in, is that we are to a very large extent enslaved by the consciousness of our friends and our relations and our neighbors who might not see it our way. And that's quite a tough thing to, to think about. It's not all good news. <coughs> so dangers of the current situation. I feel personally that there is, a, is currently an insufficient resistance and a lack of focus in what we might broadly term the freedom movement. So if I think back to, I don't know about you guys, but um, I've sort of, as I mentioned earlier, I've sort of been awake to things, things are not right since about 2006, so which is quite a while. But one of the things I have noticed is that the freedom movement such that it was about eight, nine years ago, certainly, maybe a bit, even a bit more recently, was a little bit more focused, but it was a lot smaller. What I do find now is that although the freedom movement is much larger, and we have a much greater number of people who are, broadly speaking, aware that something isn't right, that the information that we are given through official channels of information is doesn't really hold together. And, and maybe that's the description of whether you're in or out of the freedom movement, broadly speaking, I suppose. But that's actually quite a low bar. You know, that's not a very um, high level of, of, of standard for getting your information, just noticing that something's not right. It's, um, but, but it is a much bigger movement, there's no question. Um, which is good, that's, that's got to be a good thing. Now, I also, actually one other thing I should have said um, on that point is that I, I think that uh, there's quite a lot of distraction, um, and I think there's a lot of confusion, and maybe even some infiltration going on, quite a lot of infiltration in, in, in what you might call the freedom movement as well, where there wasn't to the same extent beforehand. Um, now there are some deeper deceptions at play, I don't know whether you agree with me, but um, what I call the great reveal, uh, others call that the great reveal as well, not just me, I can coin that term. Um, but it's this, this idea or this, this concept that um, uh, all the things that are coming to light um, about what went wrong over the last three years is coming to light perhaps a little too easily. Uh, it's almost being guided that way in some ways. Um, and there are many in the movement that are suggesting, in fact, uh, that that is a direction that they are wanting to take it. Uh, it's being facilitated, perhaps. Uh, I don't know what you think, but I think that's perfectly that's a perfectly possible uh, scenario, I think. Um, and the other thing, actually, is that... Um, uh, I've already said that, freedom of movement focusing on symptoms. The other thing about the Great Reset, the Great re Reveal, I should say, the Great Reset, um, is that one of the things they're wanting to do is to take down constitutional governments. Um, and hence, I'm a little bit nervous about the Republican movement um, in this country because I think they, they are laboring under the misapprehension that by taking out the world family, uh, that that's somehow going to solve all our problems. Um, and it isn't, particularly if you understand how the Constitution works. So the framework of law that exists in this country is absolutely dependent upon the position of the monarchy. Okay, I'm not, I'm not necessarily suggesting that those who hold the position or have done recently have done marvellous things. That's not what I'm saying. 
Okay, but the, but the position and the office of monarchy is absolutely critical in our system uh, in this country, as you'll see as we move into this. So there I've said, what the deep state really fear is constitutional governments. So we need to keep those intact, um, and you'll, you'll see why as we get into it. So, um, to get into uh, the subject, uh, you, you're, going to, you're going to be hitting some quite deep subjects tonight. I'm going to be testing it. I'm not going to be sending you off to do any homework. It's not quite that bad, but um, it, you know, it, it's, not, it's not going to be lightweight, some of this. Um, and there's going to be quite a lot of reflective stuff as well later on, which is quite important. <coughs> so to get us through the conceptual, um, take you through the sort of the conceptual bridges, if you like, because what I'm going to explain now is the sort of foundation, if you like, for um, our Western governments, um, the foundation of law, where it comes from, to give you a little bit of a sense of, of how that, what, why it was set up in the way that it was, uh, and the fact that it was essentially based on individual rights. Which is actually really important because what it does is it gives us the links through, ultimately, to things like natural law, which is what we're going to get into um, a little bit later. Okay, so we, we start um, with the concept of free thinking and free will. Okay, and the important point there is that we we have that, as individuals. We are free thinking, and we're all individually free thinking. Okay, if we have to think as a group, that's not free thinking. Okay, because you're not thinking freely as, as freely as the next person. You're yeah, you're having to, to be in lockstep. So the fact that we are free thinking individuals and we have free will uh, is it leads us to the understanding that we are individuals. I think we know that, obviously, I think we, but... We're also self-determining, and we're interested in self-improvement and fulfilment. And we're also interested in that for other people, too. Okay, so we, want, we somehow, in our lives, want tomorrow to be a bit better than today. There is actually a trajectory uh, that we're on. Um, otherwise, uh, there's no sense of fulfilment. Okay, so betterment, if you like, is, is a key thing to our individuality. Yeah? And we gain a lot of satisfaction from that as, at an individual level. So individualism is often, because what I'm, I'm alluding to here is the concept of individualism, which is, which is everything that is about individual rights, that, that we have rights as individuals. Okay, but a lot of people would claim uh, in life today, that the concept of individualism is, is inherently selfish because it's only thinking about us, which is incorrect because that's not what it's saying. As I've already said, we want the same and want the best for others too. And we recognize the fact that other people, those outside of us, are also special individuals and we care about their successes too. That's the concept of individualism. So what this is bringing up is the, the responsibility to ourselves and to others. It's, the, it, it's that integration of the two things. I tend not to use the word balance, okay? Because rather than using the word balance, the problem with balance is that it's like you've got a scale from left to right. And as you move from one end to the other, you're kind of losing one thing in order to gain the other. So most of these things that I'm going to be talking about today, I tend to think of as integration. It's where you're bringing things, two sides together, and you're integrating them into a whole. Okay, so, um, so that's what I would say about this, is that the, this is about the responsibility to yourself and your others. And what we're really talking about there is the rights, is your rights and your obligations to others. So the rights is about you, and we'll get into this, but it's about your boundaries. Okay, it's about, it's about you enforcing the masculine aspect or energy of yourself. Okay, whereas the, the obligations is the reaching out to others and the care that we have for other people. Yeah, and that's the divine feminine energy in there as well. So we're talking about, this is really important, 
voluntary action. Okay, co-creation. It feels good because it's voluntary and because other people are volunteering into that relationship of being in a group. So we can be in a group, but we're in a group voluntarily as individuals. Okay, so, um, and, and when we, we it, it feels good because it's voluntary, it feels in the physiology. That means that we actually can test for it physically as well. So um, you, know, you get uh, rushes to the brain when you have um, a, a good feeling about something, and we can test for that, and that's a physiological reaction. Okay, so we know, therefore, that that individual co-creation produces that, because we're social animals. Yeah? So our needs are linked to each other. So what, this is, what I'm talking about here is the, the relationship between us as, a, as individuals but how it works as a collective. Because what they will tell you is that it's all about collectivism. Because collectivism is all about not thinking about yourself, but thinking about everybody. And the trick that they've played there, yeah, is that they, they've airbrushed out the concept of the individual and the fact that it's voluntary. The fact that you do want to take part in group activities and be a collective but you want to do it voluntarily. Why? Because we're all different. And we express our needs differently and our desires differently. Yeah. And the last point I wanted to make on this slide was the fact that we, um, we have a inbuilt moral rudder that's actually built into us. Okay, and that is our conscience. But we all have that as individuals. Another thing that proves that we are individuals and not a homogenous collective. Yeah, we all have that ability to, to know deep down right and wrong behavior. Yeah, we have a moral compass. Yeah, and that means that morality is absolute. It can come to be known. Okay, so one of the biggest dangers, and it by the way is actually one of the top tenets of Satanism, is moral relativism. The idea that you get to decide what is morally okay and not. Not the case. And I'm not saying that through some kind of religious doctrine either, because I'm not religious. Okay, this, this absolutism of morality is built into the universe, and that is natural law. It's a science, because you can test it Okay, and you'll see what happens when there are all sorts of effects that if you take part in wrong behavior as opposed to right behavior, you will get effects back from the universe. Not necessarily immediately or straight away. Often it's quite a while down the line, but it will happen. Because the universe fundamentally functions on cause and effect. We're gonna get into that a little bit more later on. But that's a really important point. Morality is absolute. Okay, that means that we have to learn it. We have to understand it. Now, in most cases where it's simple, you know, quite a lot of morality actually is quite straightforward. Right behavior can be, can be known quite easily. And, it's, and we often talk about it, don't we? We talk about harming others. Okay, so it's the sort of seed or, of, of what we talk about the common law is that essentially it's about harming others. Do no harm. Yeah, don't take other people's stuff pretty easy, yeah? But you'll, you'll discover later as we get into the talk that morality gets quite complicated as well. Uh, and in fact, we do an awful lot to hide our own behaviors to ourselves. It goes subconscious. And we can get into all sorts of quite interesting things later on. Oh, there is another point, actually. Um, sovereign being, a sovereign being is a self-master. Of course, this is important. Okay, that is somebody who has no external authority. Um, so if you are being a true sovereign, it means that you are completely the master of yourself in your morality. And you conduct yourself absolutely knowing that you have ultimate responsibility. Yeah, there's no, no liability protection or anything. You can't outsource stuff. 
I can't say, well, I'm just going to um, outsource my children's education or um, <laughs> uh, outsource the care of my elderly parents or whatever it is. All of those kinds of things that we all do, can't do anymore. Okay, that's not the, the actions of a self-master. Somebody who takes ultimate responsibility for everything in their lives. Okay, that's tough. Okay, because that, that you know, being free is not easy. I say to people sometimes, do you want to be free? Do you really want to be free? Actually, because what does it mean to be free? Yeah, so that's what we're facing. Yeah, and, and what we're actually saying here is that a true sovereign or a self-master is an anarchist. Okay, in the true sense. Because it means that you, there are no external rulers in your lives. You are conducting yourself absolutely morally all the time. And it's tough, I can tell you. Well, I can't tell you, because I'm not there yet either, but people who have done it, wow, you know. So, equity and inequity is describing this idea that everybody is equal before the law. Okay, because a system in a conscious society, everybody is equal before the law. You can't start that society with some people just beginning that, that situation as being more in authority than others, having more power. It doesn't make sense. So a conscious society of people who are anarchists or self-masters would be completely equal before the law. Yeah, and that's equity an equitable society. Okay, so the nature of government. Yeah, this is really dry, isn't it? This is really... <laughs> but hopefully it won't be as we get into it. It's, um, it's quite heavy going somewhere. Now, what I want to talk about here is the relationship between the people and some organisation that supports their living. Okay, because that's what we think of as the government, isn't it? So the key to this is Fundamentally, what's the relationship between the people and that organisation that's there to assist us in, you know, maybe having an easier time, doing a bit of admin for us or something or whatever? Okay, what's the, what's the relationship between those, those two entities? The first thing actually to say there, of course, is that the people are real. Okay, they actually exist in nature. Uh, but, the, but that organisation that's supposedly supporting us in our administration is not. The people who work within it are, okay, but the thing, it's, it's, it's that word beginning with G, government, um, is, is a figment of our imagination, isn't it? It's a fiction. It doesn't actually exist in nature. It's an abstraction of the mind, if you like. So the people are in authority over their own government. Or is it the other way around? What is it supposed to be? Because really, everything boils down to that. How is, how, well, there are two questions, actually. How is our society actually set up? Is it the first, first thing, or is it the second thing? And the second question is, how do we want it to be? Because they're actually two, possibly two different things. Yeah? Now, people sense that there is something wrong with the government, that they can't necessarily express what it is. They know that they're, at, they're behaving badly, and you know, there are things, they're restricting our liberties. Yeah, but they, there isn't much of a, an understanding or a knowledge of, of at what point did they step over that line? Yeah, what are they okay to do, and what are they not okay to do? Yeah, that's really important. Yeah, and the people of this country and most other countries of the world don't actually know that. They don't think about these questions. They don't consider them. By the way, this very subject that we're talking about now used to be called civics. And it actually, it used to be taught in schools, apparently. Um, I don't know when it stopped, because I wasn't around when it did, but, um, but I don't ever remember it really being Taught. Does anybody, any of you, any of you remember that being taught in school? Civics? Yeah, one or two? Yeah, not many. Wow. Interesting. So, as I say, what is the original setup? Uh, we're talking about the limits of a governing system. Is it A, a tyranny? In other words, it's, it's where they're in control, ultimately. Uh, or is it B, actually it's the people in authority there? 
okay, because the people created the government in the first place, and you know, it's it's got to be one of those two, yeah. So if the framework was set up correctly, then people need to know what that is, okay? And it, it is, by the way, the Constitution, okay? It's, it's limitations that define government crime. That's a bit of a step, isn't it? Okay, we actually think the notion of, of government actually being criminal. Uh, some people will find that really refreshing to actually hear that being expressed. Others will be horrified at the idea that actually our government could be a criminal. Okay, but yes, of course it can be. And it has on many occasions through history and in other countries too. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, if, if the government is acting criminally, it means it's stepping outside the bounds that were set constitutionally. Okay, so the constitution really is a set of standards by which the government can behave. Now the reason why we need that is because the government itself is a law-making mechanism. Government can make law, and that's why people get a bit confused with the idea that government can be a criminal. Well, yeah, they can because there's something higher that binds them, yeah, and imposes limitations on them. So the governing framework, the constitution, okay, so this is, this is quite, looks quite dry, a bit of a dry old duffer here, doesn't it? Actually, he's a bit of a legend. Okay, this is a man called Lysander Spooner, who's actually a, a lawyer, an American lawyer. But have a listen to this, okay? The authority to judge what are the powers of the government and what are the liberties of the people must necessarily be vested in one or other of the parties themselves, the government or the people, because there is no third party to whom it can be entrusted. If the authority be in, invested in the government, the government is absolute and the people have no liberties except such as the government sees fit to indulge them with whatever you're given by government. Yeah? If, on the other hand, that authority be, it be vested in the people, then the people have all of the liberties as against the government except such as substantially the whole people through the jury, you can see where this is going, choose to disclaim, and the government can exercise no power except such as substantially the whole people, through the jury, consent that it may exercise. Lysander Spooner, and this is really important, you can get this by the way on the commonlawconstitution.org website, okay, which I'm going to go on to a little bit later. This is an essay on trial by jury, 1852. Okay, it's a really important document. And if you're, if you're at all into reading, you know, when I say to people, well, have a read of that essay, you know, that's a bit heavy going for quite a lot of people. But actually, it's, it's brilliant. It's really refreshing stuff to read. You should download it and read it. It's really good. So we're talking about the limits on government. <clears throat> the people own the government. Uh, limitations on government defining the set of standards in which government can operate. So this is about the people themselves defining their own liberties and standards by which they wish to live by. That, that's what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. It, that's the people being sovereign. It's some kind of mechanism that allows the people to decide for themselves what the edges of moral behaviour are, and therefore, inversely, what their liberties are. It's the people that decide that. In a, in a legitimate, proper, constitutional government. So now we're getting on to democracy and its true meaning. Okay, its true meaning is that the people rule. That's what it means. It comes from... Um, well, actually, I'll get on to that a little bit later. We'll go on to uh, the derivation of that. So here's another um, quotation from Lysander Spooner. Uh, same uh, essay. Any government that is its own judge of and determines authoritatively for the people what are its own powers over the, over the people is an absolute government, of course. It has all the powers it chooses to exercise. There is no other or at least no more accurate definition 
of a despotism than this. On the other hand, any people that judge of and determine authority should be for the government, what are their liberties against the government, retain all the liberties they wish to enjoy. And this is freedom. So again, 1852 essay, an essay on trial by jury by Sanders Kuhnemann. Right, let's have a look at what's actually going on now. <laughs> suffrage and majority consensus. Now the interesting thing about suffrage, and those of you who don't know what adult suffrage is, that's the voting in elections. That's the whole system that everybody says is democracy, when in fact it isn't. Okay, now the interesting thing about this, and you need to consider here the nature of truth discovery, we're gonna get onto this a little bit later. Now, who do we think is most likely to be right about something, the majority or the minority? Most of it, what do we all automatically usually think is, is the case? We normally think the majority is more right, don't we? Yes, except there is a problem with this, okay, which is usually that the path to truth is uncomfortable because of the nature of truth because truth is often quite uncomfortable. And it's also through laziness that a lot of people reach their opinion. So where are we going with this? So I'm saying that the majority reach a position more quickly but do so through a lack of discipline, rigor, and courage, usually. The minority are often closer to the truth in their understanding. They've arrived at a more carefully considered position. They've often taken longer, they've taken more courage to get there. Okay, because the truth is often quite uncomfortable. Yeah, so we're getting to the conclusion here that quite often the people that are right are the ones that are actually in the minority, not the majority. <clears throat> so at the moment, we have a system of governance that rewards the lazy majority. Okay, the ma who have applied less consideration. It's whimsical. People just think, you know, quite, quite surface about all of these things. The Constitution doesn't use suffrage. Not for policy, it doesn't, anyway. It does for getting people into office, actually. Something else is much more incisive and fair is needed to decide on the boundaries of what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable in society. Something, something different than just voting. Voting, giving grown adults the illusion of control. Yeah, it's, we've probably heard that before. Good meaning, that one. Yeah, it's the sort of thing that gets people really thinking. Yeah, so we've got a lot of contradictions going on here already, yeah? And, and this talk is going to be raising and exposing a lot of contradictions in our thinking. Because this is the only way, really, that we're going to be able to pull this around. Is by showing people the cracks in their worldview, the contradictions in their worldview. And you'll see how we get onto that a little bit later. So, limits on government. Oh, that's That's all that. Sorry. Sorry. Oh yes, that's the last point I wanted to make. It's a bit of a surprise to, to me. Referenda, not constitutional. Okay, so we often talk about, oh, Switzerland has a whole country voting all the time on policy. It's just, it's just more suffrage. Yeah, and it encourages people to be whimsical again. Okay, so what are we, what, what's the alternative? It's this, the jury. Okay, and I sometimes call this the justice laboratory. Because if you've ever seen a jury in action, and, and we don't generally in this country because we're not allowed to, but I'm going to show you a place later where you can see it in action with a really deep issue, a really difficult, 
complicated, knotty subject. And over days, it really is a justice laboratory, I can tell you. So this is what we're looking at, the jury. Now let's just go into statute law, because statute law doesn't have to come up all one at a time, it doesn't matter. So what it's about is it's modelling human behaviour through legislation. This is what we've got at the moment, legislation, statute law. Okay, statute law, by the way, can exist under law, even under common law, properly. It's okay. Okay, a lot of people are saying in the movement that, oh, no, 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 legislation and statute law is just automatically bad. No, it's probably more what they've done to it recently. Okay, but statute law was always able to exist um, because the king produced it under common law. And, and there's actually quite a lot of good statute law out there. There's a lot of great bad statute law as well. But what is it really at the moment? It's about modeling human behavior through legislation. Okay, it's prescriptive, set, prescriptive sets of conditions built into legislation ahead of time. Okay, the thing hasn't happened yet. Somebody hasn't actually supposedly committed any kind of crime. But before that's even happened, we've got a bunch of people kind of imagining what might happen. Yeah, an attempt to improve, oh no, I'll come on to that in a minute, sorry. That's, that's, uh, actually, no, I will talk about it now. Uh, an attempt to improve the flexibility of statute law is, um, and to appear more organic uh, comes in the form of what I call defences that are built into statutes. Okay, so a statute by itself is basically saying, if somebody does this, um, then this, this is the kind of punishment they get. But it doesn't take into account anything to do with the organic behaviour that happened beforehand, all the myriad of different reasons as to why they may have done it, and what the circumstances and conditions were at the point when they did it. Because what happens in a jury is it looks at intent, it looks at the principles, the moral principles behind it. And that doesn't happen with statute law. You either broke the law or you didn't. There's no kind of like checking on what actually happened. Yeah. So what makes it worse is that they've, they've actually introduced what they call defences into legislation, which is another whole list of possible further sort of final resolution uh, things in order to, to, to create more possible outcomes, to make the programming just that little bit more complicated, to try to think ahead of all the, or as many as you reasonably can of all the possible things that could have happened when that person broke that statute, that piece of legislation. Yeah, all you're doing is you're just thinking of more and more lists of possible things, and you'll never get to the end of that list. Okay, those are called defences. You get them in case law as well. So it's creating a final resolution. Now the other thing that it's doing, these defences, is that it's protecting legislation from the judgment of peers. Okay, now why is that? This is getting a bit subtle because what's happening is in our magistrates' court is that in um, uh, where we don't get jury trial, it means that the legislation that that is used in those cases where it doesn't get you to, to a jury trial never gets tested before a jury. Okay, because remember the whole point of trial by jury, if you've already... Um, looked at any of the interviews that, that I've, um, I've had recently in the last three months or so, you'll know that trial by jury, and I'll come on to it in more detail in a minute, is all about judging the legislation itself. Now, if the statute law never gets to a jury trial, it doesn't, you never get an opportunity to test that legislation. Yeah, so the more defences that are in place, the more protection it gets from getting there. Um, as well. So what we're talking about here is, a, is um, an algorithmic matrix of possibilities. It's kind of like future programming. It's about pre-crime. It's essentially pre-crime. It's, it's making, making up what, or modelling the future behaviours of humans. And I think they're doing that with most things, aren't they? Aren't they into modelling? Using computers? creating a matrix of, of possibilities, yeah? Everything's like that. And statute law is like that as well, yeah? It's not looking at the causes and um, the intent behind it. So the mechanisms of the Constitution. 
Here we go, trial by jury. Now there is a concealed second purpose of trial by jury that most people don't know about. Very few people in the country are aware of this, um, except those that watched um, Neil Oliver on January or whatever it was when I happened to blow the lid and get all sorts of flack for it uh, over the next over the week that followed. Um, and I got all sorts of stuff, and I knew I was over the target. Um, because when they start calling you an anti-Semitic or a right-wing extremist or whatever, then you know that you're over the you're over the target with stuff. Okay, but this is what I was talking about: was the second purpose of trial by jury. Okay, and that second purpose, other than just to judge the accused, is to judge the piece of legislation that brought that man into court. Okay, that means that basically the people in the jury can disagree with the legislation. They might not, they might be completely good with the legislation, because sometimes it's very good. But it's the fact that they can disagree and, and judge independently means that they are sovereign. That means they are getting to decide, no, that's not a piece of law that I'm going to, I'm just going to ignore that piece of law, because for me it doesn't work, and I'm on the jury. You're the highest law counsel of the land if you are on a jury. It's quite a privilege to be on a jury when you know that piece of information. Yeah? Okay, now if, um, the, the, I, I'm increasingly using the term jury independence because it's actually quite difficult to know whether or not the not guilty verdict, even though it's quite obvious that the person has broken the law technically, you still don't necessarily know, because you don't really know all the reasons for every juror as to whether or not it's a case of annulment. So annulment meaning, no, we're just ignoring the legislation here. Because there can be other reasons, actually, why a jury might just also return a not guilty verdict, even though it's quite obvious they've broken the law. Yeah, it might not necessarily be that they disagree with the legislation. Okay, they might, might be just worried about um, evidence, they might be worried about the punishment that he's going to have to get because they've decided that it has to, has to be that. So there's no way that, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why that might be. But that second purpose of the jury is the key. The fact that they have an independent decision to judge on the legislation that's been produced from government. So jury independence and annulment by jury. Alexis de Tocqueville will describe the jury as a political institution embodying the sovereignty of the people and the very best way of preparing a people to be free. Now that second bit is the really exciting bit. Okay, the first bit is pretty amazing because it embodies the sovereignty of the people. We just talked about that just then. But the second bit just takes it even further. It just keeps getting better and better, ladies and gentlemen. This bit here, Okay, is all about preparing a people to be free. Why? Because it's all about the raising of consciousness. Because if you're on a jury and you've got to talk about all of this stuff, you've got to discuss it, you've got to think it through at that level, you've got to face your demons, you've got to face your prejudices, there's all kinds of things going on in a jury that are causing you to reflect on your own stuff. And when a, a, a nation fundamentally has ju jury independence at, at its core, at its constitutional law, then, you, then you've got a raising of consciousness going on. If you don't, you've got a deterioration in morality. We'll come on to that a little bit more. So here, here's quite a well-known chap, Winston Churchill. Churchill on the importance of trial by jury. The power of the executive to cast a man into prison without formulating any charge known to the law, and particularly to deny him the judgment of his peers, is in the <coughs> highest degree odious and is the foundation of all totalitarian government, whether Nazi or communist. Sir Winston Churchill, Exeter Telegram from Paris, the UK, Home Secretary. So that is quite quite an important one, there's Churchill, relatively recently, talking about the power of trial by jury. So just very quickly about the head of state. So the head of state and the tree of oaths. 
So you guys probably know about all this already. Um, this is what we're actually talking about. The head office of state is at the top, and then underneath that, we've got a tree of oaths that are taken by public servants. Pre-1215, common law, um, and uh, this was about uh, this was at the time of the Saxons, um, and even back into Europe, pre-Saxon times, um, and uh, I've got Emperor Conrad there um, as an example, because um, he was expressing also the right of a jury to judge on the justice of the law as well in a very similar text to Article 39 of Magna Carta, but that was 200 years before Magna Carta. Okay, so when people say, say to me, oh, the Constitution, what is the Constitution? Oh, Magna Carta is all sorts, it's, it's, it's defunct, it's got, you know, there's all sorts of things that are being said about Magna Carta, which are very easy to kick away, by the way. But our Constitution didn't begin with Magna Carta. It was in place before that. 1215 Magna Carta was the last clear expression of the constitutional principles in writing. Okay, when people say we don't have a written constitution, we damn well do. It's Article 39, Article 40, and Article 61 in particular of Magna Carta 1215, and there are some other bits as well. It's not the whole thing, necessarily, but the constitutional <coughs> principles are contained within those important Articles of Common Law, which is what they're called. Okay, the Articles of Common Law are what make up the 1215 Magna Carta. So, funnily enough, ladies and gentlemen, our Constitution is based on Common Law. So, one of the issues we've had in the Freedom Movement is a lot of people kind of going off and talking about Common Law as this weird magical thing. It's what underpins our Constitution. So, under the Constitution, it's functioning correctly. The King or Queen is not all-powerful. They are the most senior public servant, and they are the first among equals. You probably have heard us talk about that um, uh, on various interviews and things. Okay, so they, they have the ultimate responsibility. Yes, it's quite a special position, but it's quite a responsible position as well. It's not just ceremonial. It's not meant to be just ceremonial. Uh, and this is quite an interesting one from David Hume's History of England. The king, so far from being invested with arbitrary power, was only considered as the first among the citizens. His authority depended more upon his personal qualities than on his station. He was even so far on a level with the people that a stated price was fixed for his head, and a legal fine was levied upon his murderer, which, though proportionate to his station, and superior to that paid for the life of a subject, was a sensible mark of his subordination to the community. Okay, David Hume's History of England, and there are other places that talk about that quite clearly as well. So if you think about now, our, our monarchy, in our country now, it doesn't have that character, does it? Yeah, and uh, and we'll know that you know, of course, that the late Saxon kings, King Alfred, Edgar, Edward the Confessor, were often referred to in our history as the humble kings. Yeah, they were the ones that put the law together and understood it in the way that we're describing now. So things have gone massively wrong in the last eight hundred years. Massively. So, English common law constitution, a historical foundation. So, going back even further now than the European uh, 200 years before Magna Carta I was talking about just now, so into the ancient Hellenic constitution of Athens, uh, and specifically with the aristocrat Cleisthenes around 508 to 507 BC. And what we're talking about here is there is the exousia rights. You can go and look this stuff up. Okay, the exousia rights comes from the, the, the word authority in Greek, I think it is. Okay, and then we get to democratia, democracy, yeah? Demos and kratia. Kratain is the verb, <coughs> the people rule. Yeah, so true democracy is nothing to do with voting in elections, ladies and gentlemen. 
It's to do with having a mechanism in which it's built into your constitution in which the citizens are the final arbiter of law. And they are anarchists. Then they're being left alone, basically. So that means, ladies and gentlemen, that the government in that situation isn't a government at all. If it's operating correctly, it isn't a government. Because who's doing the governing? The people are doing the governing through the jury. Yeah, so that's what we really mean by democracy. It's the only way that has ever existed on this planet where you can have an organic nation that's contained within borders and still have the people living as anarchists, being left alone to be their own masters. The big question is, is that are we all right to be our own masters at the moment? So, further quotations. The jury were the judges and judged both law and fact. Okay, so this, this is from um, Jeffrey Gilbert's History of the Common Pleas. No cause of consequence was determined without the king's writ. For even in the, the county courts, of the debts which were above 40 shillings, there issued a justices or a commission to the sheriff to enable him to hold such a plea where the suitors, that is the jurors, are the judges of both the law and fact. So that's the jury judging the law. Because what they'll tell you now, and what the, the judge will tell you, and I didn't say earlier, I should have said it by the way, I'm sorry. In a properly functioning common law trial by jury, you don't have a judge, you have a convener, somebody who basically runs the affairs. The judges are the jurors on the jury. I should have said that, yeah? So what this is actually saying is that the judges are the judges of, sorry, the, the jurors are the judges of law and fact. Because nowadays, the judge will tell the jury that they are not to be judging on the law. They are to be taking directions from the judge. Well, not according to our constitution, that isn't the case. So, this is about the nobility um, and absolutely being dependent upon a wholehearted assent of the armed common men, generally called free men or freeholders of their neighbourhood. The majority of the male population were known as free men. Without their support, the nobility were impotent. That's quite important, that, uh, that piece of information there as well. Yeah, so again, it's, it, it, it's adding weight to this idea that even within the, the aristocratic system that was set up, we've understood it incorrectly. It's not really about them lording it over people. The aristocrats were absolutely dependent upon the common man. And there was a kind of a synergistic effect, a relationship, a bond between those two. Right, so a quick um, uh, historical summary of the, of the rule of law and where, how things have, have gone. So the genuine rule of law, when the constitution is functioning correctly, <clears throat> Again, they should have come up in one, but it doesn't matter, yeah, one at a time. The people decide on the moral framework of their community or society. It's the people that do that. They do this through the jury, which is a natural law tribunal. Because what they're doing is they're tapping into natural law through their conscience. It's based on moral principle. The minutiae of people's lives is not defined or prescribed and certainly not by government. You must, you must have a license for this. You can't do that. None of that was going on. Under the constitution, you don't get to decide that. The government certainly doesn't get to decide that. Okay, it's only about right and wrong behavior. Law, that is. So what does that do? That leaves a, a more open landscape of freedom, which is not prescriptive means you're free, as long as you're not harming other people. Very few statutes, and this is important now, okay, is that those statutes that were in place, which they were allowed to put in place, the king could write statutes, and often wrote very sensible ones. What, what was the true nature of those statutes? They couldn't punish by themselves. You could never be punished by a statute. 
Why? Because you're always coming before a jury trial. All the courts that existed under the Constitution at that time were all courts of conscience. Okay, so the court lead, the court baron, the 100th court, all of these different kinds of courts, the local ones, the more distant ones, the equivalent of the county ones, they were all jury, jury trials, courts of conscience. That means that no statutes could punish by themselves. All they were there for was to flag people up that it needed to be brought before a court. Okay, that was the point of a statute, really is it's a flagging up exercise. It's saying, hang on a sec, we're a little bit worried about what you're doing here. Um, so you need to come before a court. But it might be all right. It's up to the people. Very different now, isn't it? Okay, and then the fake rule of law, as I call it, that's what we've got going on now. So that genuine rule of law was gradually covered up and distorted through confusion and obfuscation. Funnily enough. Um, what a surprise. Trial by jury was weakened gradually over time. Okay, and the ways that they did that was quite subtle. So, for example, in um, 1483, I think it was, they introduced legislation to change the meaning of the word free man. Okay, because you often get people saying nowadays, oh, no, Magna Carta only benefited the barons because they were the free man. You know, no. Free man originally meant commoner. Okay, and it was only later, in 1483, that the word free man changed its meaning. I think it was around then, it might not have been, I can't remember for certain. Okay, but what that meant was that it effectively meant, meant that a, a huge portion of the population were denied access to being on jury trial. And that happened at various points through history. So it's been replaced by a system of governance based on voting in the majority party. And that came around sort of early 1700s to the mid 1700s. In fact, all of that started really, it started to go, well, it, it's been going wrong for a long time, but particularly the 100 years from sort of mid 1600s to the mid 1700s. That represented a massive increase in the power of parliament. And that was, that was when things went badly wrong. Um, and the Bill of Rights, by the way, was um, in a sense that as well, because it contradicts itself. The Bill of Rights is a problem. A lot of people say, oh, no, it's a proper constitutional piece of law. No, it's not. The Bill of Rights is a statute. It's a piece of legislation. Um, and, 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 it, and it also maintains that problem with the jury as well. In, there are about three or four issues with it. But anyway. And statutes can now punish Intent is ignored. So intent, by the way, I should have said the, the Latin word that they're looking for is mens rea, which is loosely translated, but it's changed over time, um, is malice support. Okay, malicious intent. It's the easiest way of thinking. Think. That's, what, that's what a jury is looking for when they're deciding on, um, on, on, on uh, whether, whether somebody's guilty or not. Um, it's no longer based on principle, and it's now all about order following. Yeah, and we're going to get into order following, because that's really serious stuff. Um, and uh, actually, very quickly, I think I'll just, I'll, I'll just do this very quickly, The Healing Power of the Constitution. Um, so this is a good book, The Juryman's Tale by Trevor Brown. Um, I've got no title on that. Oh, yes, I have. It comes up in the wrong window. There it is. Anyway, it's not. Um, being a juror is all about conscience, testing for that absolute morality. Morality is not relative. As a juror, we may have to face our own prejudices and inner lies about ourselves. Um, I've got a video that I've actually taken it out because we haven't got time and the sound system won't deliver it. Um, it's all about being forced to be in a room until the job is done. You are facing some dark stuff, okay? And natural law is about right and wrong behavior. It's about understanding rights that are defined um, in the universe. Okay, so, so rights are defined, actually the wrongs are defined in the universe, actually, not your rights. And this is important. So I've said here, rights are defined in what's called the apophatic. Okay, and if you define something in the apophatic, it means that you're, just, you're defining it in the negative. 
you are saying what something is by saying what it isn't. Okay, and that this is part of um, occult knowledge, actually, uh, things like apophatic, and there's all sorts of things we're going to get into later. Okay, but the Ten Commandments is, is a, a good example of that. Yeah, thou shalt not. Okay, and it's defined in the negative for that good reason, because what it's doing is it's defining the edges or the boundaries of acceptable behaviour. Okay, so if you've got law that's defining a list of what you can do, you're in big trouble, because that list will never end, and you'll forget stuff. Because there's going to be millions of things that you can do that are perfectly okay. Yeah, what we should be doing is defining things in the apophatic, which is what that does. Juries, raising of consciousness. Trevor Grove, so that book, The Juryman's Tale, this is, is the name of the book, by the way, it's really good, really interesting. We had become professionalised. They say the office helps to make the man. Even within the much briefer compass of most trials, jury membership does seem to sum up people's civic mindedness, perhaps for the first and only time in their lives. Although this is a cynical age, honesty, fairness, and justice are concepts nearly everyone believes in even if they do not personally live up to them. And then going on, he also said, um, Grove also said that his jury seemed to have, com seemed to have common sense, good humor, skepticism, and patience. And in my view, it was the jury system itself, the fact that we were forced to act to get together in this rather daunting undertaking that helped bring these qualities to the fore. Now, there's a lot of research, by the way, that's been done by um, a number of people, even in the system, one or two QCs, for example, who've done some research into the effects of being on a jury and how it heightens people's civic mindedness. It actually raise, it, it contributes to that raising of consciousness. It's really key. So, I don't know whether any of you have um, seen this film, 12 Angry Men, but I really urge you to go and have a look for it. There is, um, I think, a copy on YouTube that you can, you can find. Um, th this, is, this is a really important film because what it shows, it technically gets some things wrong, by the way, because it actually um, uh, outlines <coughs> things like majority verdicts on juries, which is wrong. It's not common law. It's not meant to be like that. Um, and, uh, you know, every, and unanimous and things like that. It doesn't have to be unanimous. Uh, in uh, for someone to be not guilty, but it does on the common law have to be unanimous to be guilty. It's all about reasonable doubt. Okay, so common law favours liberty, essentially. Um, but what this film is really about is about shadow work. This is what we're going to go on to in the second. So if you thought that was hard, that first half, we're going to be testing you a little bit in the second one. It's going to be much more reflective uh, and much more relevant about our system today and where we are and our level of consciousness. But if you haven't seen this, I really would urge you to see it. It's all about shadow work, and it's quite tear-jerking and quite moving. Um, but go and have a look at that. That's, that's it, I'm, I'm about three minutes late on the hour, so there we go. So let's have a break, because you'll need it, I think. And then we'll start again. How much do you want, Roger? How much did you want for, for the break? Half an hour. Yeah. See you then. <laughs>
yeah, come come here and down and use this place. Um, Kirsty's been great, so big big thanks to her. Anything else that I should say? Thank you. Right, okay, so carrying on, this is going to test you a little bit more now in a slightly different kind of way. Um, and maybe you can see why. So we're looking at natural law and the occulted body of knowledge. Okay, and um, some people, when they look at that, they think, oh my god, they went occult. I'm really getting disturbed. Um, and all that means is just very hidden, very deeply hidden information. Okay, and so all these things that, that we talk about, you know, like um, what's really going on in the pharmaceutical industry, um, and uh, chemtrails and all that sort of stuff, you know, that, that stuff that, that they don't really want you to know about yet. But actually they're quite fine with that compared with this. Okay, so the stuff that I'm going to be talking about in this part is going to be the kind of information they really don't want you to know. This is the most occulted information on the planet. Natural law. Okay, and it's a subject in its own right. And people who get into constitutional stuff and common law and things like that, they sort of throw these terms around like natural law without really understanding what they are. But I challenge you to get into natural law properly. It's an absolutely fascinating subject and it's absolutely critical. And once I've told you that it's that important, it's your obligation under the universe's laws to then go and find out about it yourself. Otherwise, guess what? You're going to get karmic consequences you don't. I'm serious. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because if you know about natural law, the subject of natural law, and you don't talk about it, and you don't get it out of it, it's not good from a universal law perspective. <clears throat> So, esoteric knowledge. So, natural law is about the effects of the universe delivering back consequences of our actions. It's a real thing, and it doesn't require your belief. It's not a religion. Okay, what is it about? It's about things like, because it's about lots of things, it's about things like understanding the human psyche uh, and how we can be manipulated and mind controlled. Um, the heart of the occulted body of knowledge um, is, is natural law. That's right at the centre. So if you imagine the occult body of knowledge as a kind of circle, right bang in the centre is natural law. It's the most occulted information there is. Um, along with other things, human psyche, truth discovery, um, the trivia learning method would be one of those, for example. Subjects like alchemy, numerology, and um, the hermetic principles. Hermeticism, which is really important. We're going to go into a little bit of that as well. So what's the ultimate aim of this? What's the point of it? Well, it's all about bringing ourselves in alignment with the universe. Okay, or rather not living in opposition to it. It's about being real and authentic. Okay, it's not about putting on an act. And we all do that. And this is where we have to analyse the psyche and, and the subconscious. Because we're doing that all the time. But to be self-masters and to be conscious people, the only way that we can do that is to, is to be truly honest. And by doing, and in order to do that, we have to be absolutely conscious in our actions all the time because there is a lot of stuff that we do in our behaviour that we don't even know we're doing. And that's what we're talking about. Um, and ultimately it's about things like the three pillars of consciousness, thoughts, feelings and actions. Okay, now the thoughts, the feelings and the actions are those three pillars of consciousness. It begins with thoughts, that's the thinking, which is the idea, the sort of esoteric idea that things don't exist until they are thought into existence. So it requires, it's the concept of mentalism. Um, we'll get into that. Um, and then the feelings is how you feel about those things, which is the, which is the divine feminine. So the mental <coughs> actions is the masculine, 
the divine feminine is the is how you feel about things. Um, and then the action is is what comes from that. Yeah, and and by the way, those three things you will find in the Trinity in quite a lot of religions. Yeah, which is the, the father and the, the, the mother figure, uh, and then you've got the male child, yeah, which is the action. Yeah, so the Christ, if you like, is the action. And you'll see that in a lot of religions. <clears throat> um, a lot of this is, is about understanding, for example, much deeper esoteric uh, terms like um, the number of mankind being the 666. Okay, which is not meant to be, it's actually a mistranslation of the Bible. It wasn't actually the number of a man, it was the number of mankind, because there was, there was no article before it, either a definite article or an indefinite article. Okay, so it was the number of mankind. And that's what we're in at the moment. That's the level of consciousness that we're in at the moment, is the 666. And we're aiming to get to the 777 conscious, yeah? Which is a number, by the way, that you often see in other things. You'll see it in all kinds of things. And if any of you who um, listen to Mark Passio's material, for example, um, you'll, you'll uh, see that he talks about the 777 on being on fruit machines. You know, the, the sort of the, the goal, um, the ultimate kind of jackpot is often uh, depicted as the 777, which is their kind of way of, of sort of hiding it as well at the same time, because obviously it's not about winning money. It's about something rather more important than that. Which is gaining consciousness in this realm, yeah, the 777. Um, and then the 888, which is a like threefold infinity. If you turn the 8 on its side, it's the, it's the symbol of the infinite. Uh, can't be attained in this realm, but that's in the next, in the spiritual realm, yeah. So a lot of this is quite deep stuff. This is occulted information, but it predates a lot of our modern religions. <clears throat> so a lack of consciousness. So the subconscious and the unconscious behavior, okay? So I was talking to you just, just a little bit earlier about how we, um, we display behavior that is, um, displaying behavior that we actually don't realize we're doing it, yeah? And that's, that's often through programming. And what are those things? They're things like triggers and reactions. What are the things that trigger you? It's nasty stuff, isn't it? It's getting into this. It's really unpleasant, actually. Okay, so what we're talking about here is shadow work. We're talking about self-examination. Getting into things that are uncomfortable for us to reflect on. Facing your demons. I used that phrase earlier when we were talking about the jury. Facing your prejudices. Yeah? What is it about you that you have to bring to the surface that actually you don't really want to do? because nobody does, it's pretty unpleasant stuff. But in the doing of that, it actually brings it up to the surface so that you, you see it. It becomes conscious. Because as soon as it becomes conscious, you're starting to heal. Because we all have trauma, and that trauma is what happens, what we bury. Yeah? <coughs> the, the integration of the shadow. So what is this? Okay, so the ego is all about, well, it's very simplistic because I'm not a psychologist, but these are simple things. The ego is about drive and determination. It's where you get your drive and determination from, among other things. Uh, and it's what allows you to set your boundaries as well. Yeah, it's the assertiveness. That's where you, you're getting, because people say, don't they, particularly in the new age movement, they say, you need to live without your ego. No, that's not a good idea because you just wouldn't exist. You wouldn't feel anything um, in the, as, as an individual. You wouldn't have an individuated experience at all if you did that, if you had no ego. So it's important. So what do we actually have to do? What we need to do is to integrate. So we mustn't be too conciliatory because what that does is it denies the ego. Yeah? Uh, it's basically keeping, um, keeping your sort of, the, the, the dark side of yourself at bay and repressing it and trying to be too nice and conciliatory, yeah, and giving. Not a good idea. Because what happens, ultimately we'll build up resentment doing that, and then you get explosive behaviour. Uh, which is what I, I put there. Explosive behaviour will come out uncontrollably. 
yeah, because you're, you're denying the self. Yeah, so much of this is about two polarities. It's about bringing together two different things. Yeah, integrating two things. But if you overdo it, and you are too good with your boundaries, um, then you'll end up putting walls up, which isn't good either. Okay, so this is, this is about um, getting, getting that right. So the opposite of, of truth is about, the li about lies. Now, the truth is the universe, it's reality, it's what is. It's what's already happened, and it's what is unfolding right now. Okay, that's what the truth is. It's absolute. It's not something that you can make up. I'm talking about absolute truth, as in not your truth, his truth. I'm not talking about your perception. Okay, I'm talking about objective truth. What's provable, yeah? So humans can distort reality. Okay, we have that ability to do that. Um, and and that, the reason for that is because we have free will. Okay, we can, we can lie about things. Sometimes we actually um, need to deny reality, and there are sometimes reasons for doing that, actually. Um, good reasons for doing that. So, for example, I don't know, let me think of an example. Something like um, uh, you're in Nazi Germany and you're hiding um, a, 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 something to escape from one of the Jewish camps uh, in your basement, and one of the German guards comes to your, yeah? You're going to lie about it. Yes, so that's, that's an example there where you might need to do it. Um, we have free will to do that. Yeah. Um, now, Jordan Peterson talks about truth as the fabric of the universe, which is actually quite helpful, I, I find, anyway. So he, he imagines it as, you know, like some, some material that you see around you in the universe, and he talks about you grabbing that and turning it into a shape that it doesn't want to go into distorting it, scrunching it up or something, or tying a knot in it or something like that, I don't know, yeah? That's what you're doing when you're telling a lie, because what you're doing is you're saying something or pretending that something is not the way it really is, yeah? You've just got to be honest about this stuff. So lies, <clears throat> now we get external lies, that's the lies that we tell other people, which is pretty bad. Yeah, but you can, you could say that the worst kind of lies and the most dangerous ones are the ones that we actually tell ourselves. Okay, because that is about conditioning ourselves into believing something that isn't true. Everyone's gone really quiet. Actually, you've always been quiet. You've been quiet all evening, actually. <laughs> I, I, I did that um, with another talk, actually, and they'd all been quite noisy for it because they're quite excited and, you know, a bit of noise. But that was the point when it went quiet. <laughs> Not surprising, because it's difficult to do this stuff. So this is about the fiction becoming a fake rea a, a fake reality. Yeah. That's that's what you're doing when you're when you're telling a lie, isn't it? So how do we do this? Because we do this a number of different ways, and they're quite subtle. So we do it through exaggerating. You know, we say that you know, well, actually, we really needed to do that. It was really important that we did it, actually, in fact, when it wasn't really, I don't know. Uh, we played things down, we gloss over things, we justify things, yeah? And we pretend, and we make up reasons. Yeah, some of those kind of similar things. But yeah, we do, and you could probably think of some other ways in which we lie, but all of those things really actually are a form of lying. Okay, they're not really characterizing the situation as it really is, if we're being honest with ourselves. Yeah? And what is it that tells us that actually you, you kind of exaggerated that, you shouldn't really have done that, that really, it's not true what you've actually done. Yeah? That voice is your conscience that's doing that. Yeah? Okay, so this is all about conscious living, being conscious is all about checking yourself at the point when that's about to happen. It's becoming more aware when you're about to do it, or when you are doing it, so that you, it's not too late to undo it again. That's what conscious behaviour is. It's quite hard as well. It's, you know, it's not easy to do this stuff. 
So why do we do this? Why do we actually do these lies? Well, what's the point? It's all about discomfort. Yeah, so we want to alter truth because we don't want to face temporary <laughs> discomfort. When in actual fact, quite often, it's probably best to face that discomfort initially and be honest about it. You'll do it. Yeah. But you can understand why, but that, it, it actually makes things worse. <clears throat> So what, what that does, of course, is it leads to things like multi-layered um, distortions, multi-layered lies, because you, you kind of tell a lie but, or an exaggeration or something. And then that situation comes around again or whatever, and in order to cover up the first lie, you've got to do it again, or you've got to tell a bigger lie or a bigger exaggeration or something like that, and it all just gets a bit unpleasant, yeah? <coughs> now, um, so one thing leads to another. Now, and a good example of this sort of multi-layer lying is actually also when, it, when it's in conjunction with your self-denial as well, with your shadow stuff. Um, when you're making too many concessions to other people and too much self-sacrifice. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, you might have had situations in your family, I don't know, where someone has, um, it's a little bit like, okay, I'll come on to that in a minute actually. Um, it's a little bit like when you first meet somebody. And when you first meet someone, you're trying to make, make a good impression. Rather than making a real impression and being <coughs> authentic and being yourself, you're actually making the impression that's a little bit different and it's a bit better, in inverted commas. And you're being a little bit conciliatory and a bit kind and a bit overnight and a bit giving. Yeah? That's the kind of thing that can go wrong because you then meet them again and then you've got to carry on doing that behavior and then you get annoyed. And that relationship is built on, a, you know, it's built on lies, actually, in fact. Now you can get situations in families where you get explosive situations, it usually happens at Christmas or something like that. I don't know if any of you have had that situation where somebody just loses it. I mean, unbelievably explosive in a way that the family doesn't forget for whatever reason. And that will have happened because there will have been a lead up to that situation over years, potentially, of not setting boundaries, yeah, of denying the self too much. Yeah, and that's an, that's an example of where that can go badly wrong, yeah. So what you're getting, you're starting to see the kind of behaviours what the hell has this got to do with constitutional law, you're probably thinking. But actually quite a lot, because it's all about consciousness. Because actually this situation that we have at the moment in our society, which is all about conspiracy, and about losing our liberties, it's really a reflection of this. It's a reflection of our level of consciousness. We've got the society to a very large extent that we deserve. And why is that? Because we outsource stuff. You know, I kind of hinted at it earlier tonight, so we, we get someone else to educate our kids. We outsource our, the care of our elderly. Uh, we outsource everything, we outsource our news. Well, you guys don't. You kind of correct it that way. Um, but most people out there do. Don't they? They outsource all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And if you, if you think about what we've outsourced and not, are not taking responsibility for, such a huge amount. And so many of those things that we've outsourced have been centralised. And what does the centralisation of systems do? It distances the control of those things away from us so that we lose control. Yeah? And if we're not taking responsibility for things, that void is then filled. Someone comes in to take control and to do it, because clearly we don't want to do it. Do you see what I mean? So, so this is the problem that we've got, is that we've been doing that for so long, so many years and so many decades and actually centuries, that we're now in a situation where our very consciousness is lazy as well. And now we've got a system of law that doesn't actually give us the opportunity to act consciously and be on a jury and use our conscience. Why is that? Because 
Do you know how many, do you know what percentage of cases reach a jury? 1%. <coughs> so, the point of me telling you this is to tell you how the system's supposed to work. And the people right at the very start of all of it, not start, because it was way back before then, but in that time of medieval England when the constitution was generally working better, the people themselves who lived then knew their rights. They, they couldn't really read and write, but they didn't need to, because the constitution's not really about documents. So if somebody says to me, well, what, what happens if we find some problem in Magna Carta? Fine, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that basically what it's doing is it's expressing the principles of the constitution, constitutional rule, natural rule. And the only way that you can hold those is not prove it by some document. Do you think the government's going to roll over just because you put the magic document down in front of them? No. It does it because you assert them in big enough numbers. That's where your constitution <coughs> lies. It lies here. It doesn't lie in a document. It lies, it's all this information that I'm telling you now. It's about responsibility. And we could turn it around. If the freedom <coughs> movement, which is big now, actually got unified over this, over this material, that would be enough, I reckon. <coughs> So karma is consequence delivered by a dispassionate universe. So this is not about punishment. Okay, so bad stuff happens to us usually because it's just the effects of the universe coming back to us. And that's quite important because religions don't put it like that. They normally put it like as if it's actual punishment. You've been a bad boy. And actually, that's not what it is. It's the universe teaching us. See, that's quite good news. That's actually quite positive. <clears throat> it's really about mishandling the, the universe. That's what we're doing. That's what natural law is about. Um, or screwing around pretending that consensus is true, for example. Yeah, these are the kinds of things that are causing the problems. Okay, some quotations about lies. In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. George Orwell, just going to put one or two of these out there. That's a classic. This is a good one, actually. William Faulkner, the American author. Never be afraid to raise your voice for honesty and truth and compassion against injustice and lying and greed. If people all over the world would do this, it would change the earth. Okay, now I'm talking about things like speaking out in defense of truth when it's needed. Because not doing that is also going to bring karmic consequence from the universe. If you're not defending the truth, okay, when there's a lie out there and you know it, and you're not jumping in and calling it out, that's bad news. Okay, so just sitting on the sideline, when we know that a lie is bubbling away there, no, we need to, to step in and do that. That's kind of hinting at that. <clears throat> the truth will set you free, but first, it will make you miserable. Okay, so what you, you, you're picking up here is that there is a light side and there's a dark side. And the healing of the darkness and going through it and facing it is the most magical thing that a human can do. It's called the hero's journey. Because the real true hero, as a human, is the one that goes on this journey. Forget everything else. You know, you can, um, I, I agree that swimming the, the English Channel or uh, sailing the Atlantic or something like that is pretty heroic as well, I don't know, whatever. But I, I reckon this is probably the biggest hero thing that you could do as a human being. That's what we're called to do, is to go in and look at our stuff and learn from it. Because it heals our trauma and it, it, it raises our consciousness in the, in the process. So hermeticism. <clears throat> this is all about uh, not being um, 
You can't align with the universe without the examination of the macro and the micro. Okay, and the macro and the micro. So the, the micro is the small things in the universe, and the macro are the big things in the universe. Okay, so you could think of that as yourself at the individual level and society at large. Yeah, but you could also think of it as, sorry about the noise, I don't know why it's doing that. You can also think of it as um, as the universe, how we operate in the universe, yeah, how we, we um, interact, how we fun examining how we function in relation to the universe. Okay, hermetic science, really important stuff. So one of the hermetic <laughs> principles is um, well, we'll come on to. I'll, I'll give you an example of about four of them in a minute. All of, it's all about patterns and tendencies of the universe and us. Okay, so the four that I'm going to talk about very quickly are cause and effect. So there's a good image there of some dominoes. It's a ring of dominoes. And there's this little chap sitting in, uh, in his chair, and he's knocking the first one, <laughs> and it's coming around to hit him on the other side. Okay, so another way of looking at that is, is ripples in a pond, and you drop a stone in, and it, 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 the ripples go out to the edge, and they bounce back. Yeah, and that's what's happening. So everything in the universe, principle of cause and effect, by the way, is that there is no cause without an effect in the universe, and there is no effect without a cause. Everything is cause and effect. The universe is a complex system, basically. Principle of gender. Touched on that already. It's about the masculine and feminine. Okay, very quickly, the masculine is all about the... Um, <clears throat> about the control, the things that you, you know for sure and the things that you can prove. It's about taking things apart and proving certain things. And it's usually, I, I tend to think of it as, as the present and the past, that which is provable, okay? Um, the, the feminine uh, is all about the future, which hasn't necessarily happened yet, or hasn't happened yet, uh, and it's about possibility. It's about the magic of what could be possible. You can't quite put your finger on it, okay? The, in geometry and shapes, the masculine is the straight edges and the corners, and the feminine is, is, the, is the curves. Don't make any funny jokes, do you, um, but, it's, but it is, that's the magic of it. You can't quite get, get a handle on it mathematically either. Yeah, there's a magic to the curve in that sense. Um, and it's all about the big picture. This is the feminine, the big picture, and um, it's about, you know, uh, looking at things um, from, from high and looking at uh, a broader pattern. It's about pattern recognition and things like that, yeah? Now, if you go, if you stray too much towards the, the, I should just say, by the way, it's nothing to do with our physical genders. We have both in all of us, obviously, yeah? If you stray too much towards the masculine, you become very controlling and you move into the reptilian part of your brain and you live in fear at the most extreme end. If you stray too much towards the feminine, the divine feminine, you end up being gullible and start kind of just not really manifesting things. You imagine possibilities. You have blue sky thinking that nothing ever happens. You don't get anything done. Yeah, it's kind of floaty stuff. Yeah, but you need to be in the middle. You need to be a combination of both, an integration. Yeah, going back to that. Uh, correspondence, um, the, the principle of correspondence is whatever happens above, so below and what happens below, so above. So it's that re repetition at different uh, scopes or scales within the universe. You see that in sacred geometry. You know, the big the, the patterns you see, you see repeated in the massive things, and then you see that same pattern being repeated in the small things as well. Amazing. Um, duality, I mean, there are, I think there are seven, but I'm just giving you four here. So duality um, is about sort of what we think of as opposites, but they're actually not opposites at all. So things like hot and cold, uh, you can't quite put a finger on, you know, they're not actually opposites at all because um, cold is just a lack of heat. Um, heat is just a bit more, you know, what's hot is just a bit more heat. Yeah, so the, these things, it's actually about being the same thing, in fact, and an awful lot of things that we think of as opposites in the universe um, are actually just um, the same thing, but just, yeah, you get the idea. Now, the reason why I'm talking about these is that these things can all be applied to ourselves and the universe. It's really deep stuff, but you'd be amazed at how this can all be applied. So 
So lies, contradictions, and double think. Now what this is, is just um, little, little sort of amusing kind of things that you would almost turn into memes. Contradictions, okay? So here's the first one. A lady takes her mask off to sneeze. Think about that for a moment. Um, I saw that one being talked about the other day in the supermarket. Taking your mask off to have a sneeze. I mean, it's brilliant. Okay. <coughs> um, my tinfoil hat was more effective than your mask. Okay, now that one's a bit smug, so we need to be a little bit careful about being smug within the, um, within the movement generally. But it's actually a really, it's a really good contradiction, that one. It's an interesting one. Uh, there's no virtue in simply doing what you're told. Okay, and I didn't really go into that about order following. I should have talked about that. Um, a lot of people, that's quite a shocking statement. You know, these are all quite effective means. These. Um, there's no virtue in simply doing what you're told. Think about that for a moment. Doing what you're told, which is order following. Yeah, lack of principle, just doing what you're told. There's nothing virtuous in that at all, ever. Okay, because even if you do it, ultimately do the thing that's been suggested to you, that's fine, you're doing it, but you're doing it because you've considered the morality behind it. You're using your moral faculty. That's human. Your organic nature. Okay? Just following orders and doing what you're told is not something to be proud of. or be, it's, it's not virtuous. But that's quite a shocking statement, that, for a lot of people to hear. You go into a school and say that, You'd probably be brought before the headmaster or something. I would be. I wouldn't be able to go back and teach in school anymore. I'd be thrown out within the first week. I'd be in real trouble. <laughs> Voting. Oh, I've already had this one earlier, haven't we? Giving grown adults the illusion of control. See, these are really. This is why I go on about memes because what it's doing is it's bringing these contradictions to the surface. What do I mean by contradictions? I mean how so many people out there in society like to pronounce the fact that they live by certain principles. And yet, quite often, you'll find a compartment of their life where they're doing the exact opposite. Yeah? Showing your vaccine, your vaccine status on the way into a remembrance service. <laughs> I did see that. At one, one point, there was a, an event, a Remembrance Day event, where they had to show their papers on the way in. I mean, the, the irony of that is staggering. You see what I mean? These kind of like absolute horrifying contradictions. When you when you really tease these up to the surface and you see them, you just think there's a black humour to it. It's kind of funny, but behind it, it's really dark as well. That's the kind of stuff that's going, that's the kind of deranged thinking that's going on in our society. Oh yes, this was quite funny. My body, my choice. And this was about the vaccines and the abortion issue last year in America. Do you remember when the whole abortion thing came on in America? Oh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not really making a, a judgment one way or the other on the abortion thing itself, particularly, but what was funny was the people who got hot under the collar and started talking about my body, my choice, and we just had the whole vaccine situation. And it was just the irony of it was breathtaking, you know? And people aren't seeing it. They're coming out with this stuff, and they're just not seeing it. Oh yeah, now this one's, you're not going to like this, some of you. Talking about common law, and then immediately going off and doing admiralty letter processes. Some of you might know that I'm really hot on this, actually. Okay, so all this stuff to do with the straw man, and, and um, you know, going, going off and using, using admiralty law, letter writing processes, notices of conditional acceptance under admiralty, all of that kind of stuff. And then constantly talking about the straw man and all of that. So I'm I'm pretty pretty against that because I'm basically saying it's actually quite dishonest. Because their system, their fake system, okay, which is all about QCIP numbers and 
using you as a using your bond to make money off you and all of that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that that stuff isn't true, but I don't think that that's the answer to have everybody who's coming into the freedom movement learning about all of that. It's never worked before, and it's just causing us to go round and round. <coughs> it's dishonest because it's their illegitimate system. So you're not being honest when you're not calling them out under constitutional law, which is the system of law they should be bound by. And instead you're going off into their system, which is illegitimate, which they set up without transparency, and then you start playing them at their own games. I don't think that's honest. Now, if you get yourself into trouble, there may be situations where you might have to use it. Okay, and, and I have said that to one or two people recently where you might have to use those processes, and, and that's fine. And those people out there in the movement, by the way, who are doing that, who are experts at that kind of stuff, good for them. Brilliant. Fantastic. Because we probably need that expertise. What I'm saying is that we don't need the masses all doing it. We should simply be calling them out, the other side, in law, under constitutional law. Flying to Davos on a plane. Yeah, you could make a great meme about that. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is what I was saying at the beginning of, of my campaign back in January, February, is that really, in our hundreds of thousands, we should be getting on social media and putting this kind of stuff out and bombing it everywhere. And getting on people's pages and comments and, you know, commenting on people's comments, liking people's comments, cross-posting all the time. This should be like an everyday thing. You should be doing like 10, 15 minutes of this every day on social media. Yeah, going on to articles or videos on YouTube and, and correcting people under their comments. Yeah, this is, this is the kind of stuff that should be going on all the time. If we care about this kind of stuff, this is, this is like, people in medieval England who knew their constitution would be so ashamed of us today. They'd be talking about this every, if they were with us now, we brought them you know, forward from, from, from the past. They would be sitting us down and making us do this stuff every single day, talking about our, our law and our, our equity. I think that's probably it. Conclusion of summary. So the constitution, was constructed properly for us, and it is the tool by which we are supposed to solve our slavery problem. We've forgotten that it's even there, and we'll need to relearn its power. And I've said, and I think we're getting close by the way, but I've said for the last two, two and a half months, educate first to build numbers and knowledge, and then we'll issue challenges at that, <coughs> that point. Okay, but it's not gonna work until we've got hundreds of thousands of people really knowing about this stuff, and it's sitting here. At that point, when people are angry about it, because, because they know how the system was supposed to work, because you can't be angry about it if you don't know how it's supposed to work. When you see the contrast between the way that it would work if we had it in place and what's really going on now, that's going to get you angry. Okay, and at that point, when we've got the numbers, then we can start issuing challenges. It could be things like council tax or whatever. But basically, it'll probably be in the form of challenging um, public servants. But public, you know, challenging public servants within a, within a week of a particular council, but you've got hundreds of people doing it. Can you imagine the impact? Absolutely massive. Then you're going to be in a situation where the people behind the scenes are going to start getting pretty uncomfortable because you're shining the spotlight on them. It's a shaming exercise, ladies and gents. But one of the things that we've got to remember is that those people behind the scenes are actually just our, our friends and relations. They're actually just us. So really all we're trying to do is to help them do their shadow work. Yes? We need to start, but we need to help them do it too. 
because it is an unlawful system. The entire system of governance in this country has gone rogue, and it's happened in most countries as well. And now you know why, because you know how, how it's supposed to work. I think I'm going to leave it there, but I think we're going to have some Q&A. Thank you very much. I just want to thank um, you of freedomtribe.net and I'd like you to go on to that app regularly because you'll find it very, very interesting and useful. You can find out people in your neighborhood who are like-minded to yourself. So um, I want to thank you for that. It's very nice to give you the video in here as well. Thank you. And thank you for coming, all of you. Fantastic. What a, what a great audience. And uh, we'll, we'll test you now to see if you've got any, got any questions. And... Anyone? Uh... Uh, any questions? Go on. Fire away, sir. Uh, what, what, is the, uh, sort of root cause of, what, what is the root cause of root cause? Is it just like people's self esteem nature? Or is there like an entity out there that's manipulating? Humanity, whether it's um, your spiritual or <coughs> yeah, I don't think I can go to to that. No, I know I know what you're alluding to, and I find that all very interesting as well, actually. But I would not be uh, somebody who could stand here and start claiming that there's some kind of um, spiritual entity <coughs> that's doing that. Um, I have heard some really sensible people suggesting that. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure. But I do know um, that the more work we do on ourselves and our consciousness, the less likely we're going to end up um, getting worse. I think it's going to reverse the situation, actually. Um, it's the only way, I think. I'll just ask it the question and I'll repeat it so everybody can hear. Go on, Roger, sorry. Just talking about. Yep. Shall I just clarify that a little bit? Because I probably didn't talk about that in the um, in the talk. Okay, so statutory law. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of stories in the in the freedom movement um, at the moment um, about how statutes have become something entirely different, and they're all contractual. Um, they're all about consent. They're all about you know. Um, what goes on at the commercial end with the, with the straw man and all that kind of stuff. I don't really <clears throat> know whether that's definitely the case. I've been down all of those rabbit holes years ago myself. Um, I suspect there is some truth in it, probably. My feeling is that um, that's not the way that we should be going anyway. Now, statutory law originally was meant to be there under, under proper law, but not very much of it. So the king would write statutes, and as I explained to you earlier, which I did mention, didn't I, is that they, they really functioned as a flagging up exercise, but they couldn't themselves give you punishment just by breaching a statute. That's not what statutes were there for. <clears throat> they were to bring you before a court, essentially. So statutory law under constitutional law is, is okay, um, but keep in mind, of course, as I've talked about before in the, in the movement and in the campaign generally, that the head of state is meant to exercise the royal prerogative, which is the, um, the powers to refuse royal assent to any statutes that would be infringing on your liberties. Yeah? So one of the things I put out um, on commonlawconstitution.org about a month ago, I think it was, was that we really need to be reframing this. So when you're talking to your public servants, like your local politician or whatever, if they're starting to talk about and suggest things to do with 15-minute uh, cities, ULIS, stuff, all of that kind of stuff, if those policies that they are uh, either proposing or even entertaining the notion, that in a sense is treason, probably, thinking about, well, no, it isn't necessarily treason, it's, it's, um, 
uh, it will be a, a breach of some common law offence without question because it's actually going against your liberties and against constitutional law. It'll be misconduct in public office, probably. Again, that's an imprisonable offence. They shouldn't be even entertaining the idea of policy that would be infringing on your, on your rights and your liberties. It's not about them saying, well, that's your opinion and there'll be other people in, in, the, in the community that will, who will think differently. It's not about that. They shouldn't be entertaining those ideas at all. Because remember, the whole idea with statutory law is that there isn't much. And the whole landscape is free from, from that kind of rigorous what you should and you shouldn't be doing. It's all down to rights and wrongs. Right and wrong behavior, nothing more. Yeah. So that's a little bit about statutory law. Is there anything I missed there? I don't think so. If anything else comes up, I'll talk about it. You had a question. Well, uh, before I ask the question, I just have another comment to make. Our group has actually decided that one way of getting to people who are not as awake as we are, uh, that we're going to go into the markets of the market towns around here and ask people questions about how they're feeling about what is going on. We've done a small test so far, and it does appear to get, well, it get to the root of the problems. And I'm just suggesting that, that if all of us do things like that, as well as social media, go yeah. out and in person, not pontificate, because that, that's when you get the blank wall, but actually ask questions, and it does seem to work. But yeah. anyway, I have a question. <laughs> And the question is, um, Gloria Moss has done some research into personality types. Yes, she and has. And those yeah. of us who are awake are tending to fit into the, if you look at the Myers Briggs descriptions, we are tend to be working on an intuitive level and yeah. using facts. Um, and uh, she's worked out that 37.5% of us are of that ilk. The rest are not functioning on that level. So my Correct. question to you is, how do we find a way of communicating with our fellow citizens that we love, but they're not on the yes. same page? Has anyone I'd done any research that will, I mean, our question in going to the markets is something that is working. But has anyone found words that get through to people that work? Has anyone done that research? Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm sure they have. Um, I know that there's a, <clears throat> there's a course by Mark and Rowe, actually, um, who's an anarchist, one of the great anarchists out there, uh, on how to uh, turn that around, um, how to speak to people, I think. And that's what you're talking yes. about, isn't it? Um, and, and, and yes, I've spoken to Gloria about her research, absolutely, she's done some really good stuff on that. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I, but I don't think that, um, I know perfectly well that there's a big chunk of society that you're never going to... Uh, We're not going to crack No, but that's why I said that actually the freedom movement itself, if, if, if it was unified behind this information and we actually took action under this, I think we could, it doesn't need to be a majority, it just has to be a significant number. Um, and so I, I don't think the aim will necessarily be to convert a big chunk of society. There will be a sector in the middle that will be transferable. And, and it sounds like you're already having that effect, which is amazing, brilliant. Um, that I think would be the, you know, our, our aim. But I don't think it's gonna be a case of, we're gonna to get to a point of just 90% you know, of society are gonna be, it's just not gonna happen. Well, well, I think one of our problems is communicating. We, we're aware of lots of groups, and one of our problems is that all of our groups oh. don't have a mechanism to communicate throughout the country. Is anyone doing any research into that? I know of all the various groups that are developing ideas and everything, mm -hmm. but we haven't got joined up thinking yet. And communication <coughs> is our weakest link, isn't it? Because we yes. can't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and the media, having, not having a media that goes right across the country, is, I mean, YouTube is fine, but it's not quite enough. Yeah, yeah and, absolutely. And, I mean, how are we going to do it then? Well, that, unifying that message, and that's something that, that, 
uh, Monica and Yogi are, are, are looking at, and I'm looking at that with you as well. Um, that, that's something that is in the pipeline, well, more than that, really. Do you want to talk about it? Want to talk about that as well? Yeah. About, about yes. the, the, the app. Yeah, so the app, you can open it and you can get uh, a lot of relevant views, very interesting views. Um, also, you'll find all the uh, forthcoming events there. And uh, I think the most uh, valuable thing about it is you can find out people in your area who are subscribers and like-minded, which means you can form groups. And I think that's very valuable. And I think that really sums it all up. What Yeah, so, so the, the app. The app is um, freedomtribe.net. Freedomtribe.net. It's uh, written on the paper which I've given you already. And I think this is very valuable to us because it's our communication medium. We need to look at that every day. We can find things every day which are beneficial and useful to us. Is that regional though, or is it right across the country? Right, right across. Right across. Yeah. You could choose the extent of the area. You want to look at. <coughs> it's got a map. Um, it shows anyone who's who's um, given their details, and you can give your details as the real place or not. Um, I, I, I understand that there would be some concern about centralisation too much of the freedom movement, um, and real sovereignty is really about that kind of separation. So I'm a great believer in doing things in other ways too, like handwriting stuff on a piece of paper and passing it to somebody, you know, old fashioned ways of communicating too. So it's really important that you don't, you know, that, that doesn't become the only thing. But what, what was exciting to me about that app actually is the, um, the action aspect of it. Because I, I wrote a system, just a prototype about five or six years ago, a database system online for actions where proposed actions were put up, um, and then anyone who was logged into it could then take those actions, which would be relatively simple, which could be, you know, uh, ring a government agency or whatever it is, here's the phone number and here are the points that we want to make, just broadly. And uh, if you get 200 people doing that in the space of two days, it causes flipping mayhem. And it might start causing people to think, in that department, something's going on, you know, so those were the kind of actions that I wanted to see, that we could just put something out there and then get uni unify people so that they actually take those actions in their hundreds or thousands. And I think and that's a, a really powerful aspect of that app, which I think is really good. Because what, what's been happening in local government by the looks of it, that they've been... They yeah, think that the virtue is doing what yeah, they're told. Yeah. Because when we challenge them on things like 5G, they resort to saying yes. we're following government dicta. They're not bothered about the health and safety or planning department or health issues. So, our so it's about numbers, it's about the weight of opinion and awkward mm -hmm. questions. If they're getting yeah. those in, in large enough numbers, Just that, that's going to start causing yeah. a question. <laughs> It's going to get very important. William, sorry, this gentleman here has been wanting to ask quite Yeah, sorry, sorry. I just wanted to, you talk about challenging the public servants who are the agents of the government, and you partly answered it by, by talking about writing, but should we become conversant with the process of issuing notices to these public servants, and therefore is, is educating us on how to do that? Is that going to be relevant? <coughs> um, I, maybe later. I don't think so. I, I'm always slightly worried about notices and, and, and sort of letter writing processes, which involve sort of very particular language that people are using. I mean, that's the kind of thing that, that, that you do with, with admiralty letter processes. The great thing about proper, proper law, common law, um, is that you write things in plain English. And, and, and I would favour any action to be to be written in just in plain English. And you're calling people out in plain English, just in ordinary language. And you can do it verbally as well. 
So I don't necessarily see that it's all about some kind of secret letter writing process. I don't think that's really what it's about. It's too technical anyway. It's about people feeling it. Yeah, because in a way that's what, what custom and common law is all about. It's not about the, the, the statutory writing and codifying of things. Um, it's it's about the the strength of feeling and the assertion that's coming across. It's just that you're, that you're working, bland, you're, you're still working in their system though, of of legal statute law. So, <coughs> how do you approach it? That's that. How do you get through? How do you break through the barrier? That's the just the sheer numbers and, yeah. and, and calling them <laughs> and and asking really awkward questions in massive numbers. And I think what we'll need to do is to focus on what those would be. And I agree that that is, and I do think there's some very interesting questions about council tax, because it's not lawful. Um, anyway, yeah, so that, that's, yeah. I just don't think the numbers are quite there yet. I think it's getting, I think it's getting there, but yeah. John. John, <laughs> apparently. Yes. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I'm a little concerned that you refer to the term statute law. We have law. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. You're concerned have, about something. We have law yeah. and we have statutes. Yes. The correct term for statute yes, probably, yeah. is a statutory instrument of regulatory mechanism. Lord Justice Denning. Lord Justice Laws, Lord Justice Wolf, Lord Justice Sumpton, to name but four, have all stated categorically two very important things. You cannot overrule constitutional law. It takes precedence over all else. Over all, over all else. Over all else. Yes, Everything else. absolutely correct. Yeah. And secondly, statutes can be repealed, amended, added to, done away with. Yeah. Because what Parliament creates, Parliament can play with. Absolutely. Parliament cannot interfere with law. Yes. We have in this country 65 laws, that's it. Statutes are not law. It would otherwise say a law of Parliament. It yeah. does not. And in no statute will you find the word Law. Yes, it does not That is exist. absolutely correct. Absolutely. One, I shouldn't have used the word statute law. Right. It's one of those things that, you know. The other but thing actually, is, can, can I just say, you're, you're, this absolutely beautifully put about statute. There is a, an article that I um, put up on Common Law Constitution Law, um, which I really should draw your attention to, called the, called the Cyclic Argument of Statutory Law, which goes, sorry, of statute. I need to correct that. You do. Yes. But actually what it talks about is, is the fact that statute itself cannot be used to rewrite constitutional law. Okay, so the very point that John has just made is the fact that any statute can be repealed or amended at any point by Parliament. If that's the case, then it cannot be constitutional law because constitutional law is meant to be binding on government. It is binding on government. Exactly. So, yeah, I say it is, or is meant to be, only because de facto they're ignoring it. That's the point I'm making, but yes. Any, any statute that is contrary to law has no validity at all. It, except they will enforce it. And they cannot, and I'll give you an example. During the COVID crisis, <laughs> the Coronavirus 2020 <coughs> Act was judged null and void yes. in the High Court of Appeal, yes, which meant that everybody should have received a refund at least on the tickets they were given, but nobody was informed. Yeah. That's one point. Secondly, <laughs> in terms of uh, the other statement that the four judges and others have made, they famously have all said and I use this when I'm in court, and I never lose when I've made this one. Whilst the letter of the law is important, it is the spirit of the law that is paramount. Yes. And any judge 
or other half-baked official that tries to say otherwise is at odds with the very foundation of not just this country, but most of the countries on the globe. You referred earlier to Magna Carta having only bits valid. In fact, there are three versions of Magna Carta, 1215, yep. 1225, 20, and 1229. Yeah. People refer to Article 61 as being invalid. It isn't. The fact that Article 61 was not repealed by this <coughs> later version significant. means it still stands. Yes. The fact that it isn't in there yeah. does not nullify it. Yeah. However, nobody in this room but one has got any right whatsoever to invoke Article 61 because being blunt, you are all peasants. And if you look on your passport, there's a letter P. And they tell you that stands for passport. It doesn't. It stands for peasant. <laughs> and, the other let and the other letters that are available are QM, D for diplomat, uh, A for aristocracy, B for baron, um, and a, a QM is another one. Uh, or that, that will now be KM. Um, you, re you referred to the freemen as being the commoners, they weren't. Right, was, I'm, I can have a look at the research again, but were, it's and I can, well, I'll give you a direction to go in if you wish. The freemen, because the peasants were tied labourers, they were not free. So they didn't come under that heading. And the free men who were specifically identified were a separate group altogether that Cromwell tried to annihilate because they stood in the path of him trying to eliminate Magna Fata, as he called it. He hated it. Some aspects of Magna Carta are null and void now by default. So, for example, certain French families have died out naturally, so you can no longer adhere to the requirement to hate them. That's a damn shame, but yeah. never mind. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 I mean, without getting too much into the technicalities at this stage, the point I was making is that the constitutional principles are in those main articles. That's the point. I'm, I was focusing mainly on trial by jury. The Magna Carta was written by six Yorkshiremen in draft form of Spofford Camp. So when a Yorkshireman says we rule the world, we're not bloody kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Where are you? Where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not anybody Very good spot that there's other country we asked to get on a bus to give birth up here. <laughs> <laughs> we have compassion. <laughs> no, it's great. Thank you for that. Really. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I will say one more thing briefly. Sure. There are people in this room that know me and know the work that I do. I use ancient law. I don't loot. So, parking tickets, once somebody hands me a ticket, it is gone. It's a war of attrition, but it's gone. I'm yeah. just about to bomb council tax. Mm. Big style. Because no local authority has obeyed its own regulatory mechanism for at least 15 years. But before anybody gets excited about thinking they're going to get a full refund, we talk about the moral law, the moral code. If you get your bins empty, you pay for it because somebody has to. If you've got potholes in the road, Welcome to everybody's problem. Yes. But in theory, those should be mended. So, saying, oh, I'm a free man on the land, I don't have to pay anything, oh, I'm sovereign. Absolutely. No, you are not a sovereign, because sovereignty, being independent, means that you devoid yourself of collective responsibility. You cannot do that and live a moral life. <coughs> and the most important, and this is the last point I've raised, the most important chapter, or some people call it an article, I'm not all of which, of any version of Magna Carta is Clause 1, Chapter 1. 
And that's the rights of the church. <coughs> you have a problem there because you say you're not religious. I'm a devout Christian. I have the protection of chapter one. And that states that the rights of the church are forever protected. Where is the definition <coughs> of the church? The definition of the church is in the Bible and other leading Islamic, Jewish, other books. And that the individual is the temple of God. That means that under that charter, chapter one gives me, the individual, every protection I ever need for my rights against the despot as stated by uh, sure. Lord But those, uh, Lord those rights Gain. don't exist because the church is there or says so. They, they exist in nature because they, they can be seen. The church the tries to claim it's the organisation. itself actually shows you that they exist. So they exist prior to all of that as well. So I sort of agree, but remember what I was saying about how things written in documents don't actually matter so much as the moral principles that, yeah, so natural law in a way, the way, way you give a judge of schooling, I will tell you, I'm on notice of going to bring him 28 days for contempt, and I told him that if he gave me 28 days, I'd give him six months for contempt and false imprisonment because he's ignoring the constitutional laws of this country. He's having yeah. to think about it at the moment. Fantastic. <laughs> we'll have to yeah, get John to do a talk. Nice about that. That's really good. I think the cake with a file in it might be more prospect at the moment. <laughs> 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 Are there any other questions? You're close enough. I understand it. Uh, a lot of the laws are put in statutory instruments. As I understand it, in part of the French uh, Norman law and should not be able to be good as far as we can. It's a little hard to put them Yeah, I don't know whether, whether that's something John wants to talk about, but I think um, that's part of the change that I think that has occurred behind the scenes. So um, the statutes are always, always there under the Constitution. What's happened since, and I suspect it was probably around the late 1600s, um, is where things surreptitiously behind the scenes have gone wrong <coughs> and there's something funny that's gone on with statue. Um, I think they've probably been mirrored in some way. Um, they've <coughs> got an alternative mirrored version of it. Well, I don't know. Um, it, you're right, I mean the Admiralty Courts were talked about um, in the American Constitution actually, I think, and the, a lot of the documents that surround all of that and the reason why that, um, that all happened the, the, the reasons are stated, or some of the reasons are stated, that they were removing common law rights from citizens um, and taken into admiralty courts. It's actually said, as you mentioned, which is quite interesting sort of evidence, if you like, that that's where things have gone. I think it's also part of my class years of working, I used to use stuff as well, that's also Sure. Is that the right thing to do that all the time? Should that have done that? Well, I read to a, a column, a, 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 something to the book, which said that static instruments are not part of the law, they are French. Well, the statute was written by people who even named Saxon King, so... Well, he's just talking to me, he's to get through what he wants. Yeah, I know, what they are now is obviously something that they've morphed into something different, I would Yeah. Um, I'd like to just ask, because of the imminence of the WHO, uh, IHR, the International Health Regulation yes. Amendments, um, I don't know whether this is in, in your area or not, because it's all quite complicated, but given that the amendments are less contested, would make what's been, I've read, is legally binding the right of Tedros, never pronounce his surname, but basically the head of the WHO, he would be <coughs> possibly the sole person. He wouldn't even have to consult. And he would decide when the next pandemic is and what every one of the 194 countries have to do in response to that new pandemic. Where does where do our rights fit in with that as a nation when 
So I know that we've talked about principles quite a lot, but I perhaps I'm just a bit slow on this, but actually the actions that one can take. Because for example, when COVID hit in 2020, some kind person who I've never met since helped me through the affidavit process. Not only did it make me feel a hell of a lot better about the situation, but you know that whole thing of actually writing to the well, government and saying, I will obey your laws if you prove the following. Yes, yeah. It's an amazingly empowering thing. And, I, and you know, it's a bit of a bore having to do it three times, but they never responded. I had to keep proof of having it. done it. Um, but it meant that I could do exactly what I like without being fearful of police or anybody. And I, I think that... Did you get of, anything back? Though? No. So what, what gave you the, that sense that... Of what? Just the action. The fact well, that because taking action. I'm, I'm led to believe, and obviously I'm totally novice in this, I'm led to believe that that process is that if you send the first notice, then you say, oops, you, I asked you to reply within 14 days and you haven't, yeah. so here it is again, and then you do the default, which is the third sure. one. No, I know, I know what the process is. Yeah. And, and the default means, oh, you haven't, still haven't replied, so I am now to understand that there is no, uh, that I don't have to obey your rules, basically. So, I mean, I think those kind of processes, no, that's pretty... Do you think that that did it, though? Do you think, is there anything in that process that you think gave you any kind of success? It gave me emotional success. <laughs> Reassurance, maybe. Reassurance. Reassurance, but also, if I had been challenged, you know, I didn't do any of the stuff they asked me to do. Yeah. And that is so... That is a very useful process for anyone to go through. And I think one of the things I find lacking, and no, no offence to anybody, but I'm so interested in this idea because it's really revolutionary. But it's actually, you learn about all these things, but it's actually, what are you going to do? And somebody's mentioned apps and stuff, I'm actually only a wire to communicate, so it learn to a mobile technology at all. No, try not to. Um, it doesn't have to be on a mobile, I don't think. Sorry? It doesn't have to be on a mobile. Oh, good. I, I it can be in a browser on a computer as Okay, well. that's great. Yeah. Um, but, you know, those, those processes, I think it would be so useful for people to know how to go through them. And to, because, you know, you do need to know the rules. There, there are rules. I think... Well, do, you not think that, that, do you not think that's though, the problem, isn't it? I didn't do those things either. And I didn't send letters off. And I didn't send anything off to be signed or anything, but I didn't do them. Yeah. So that it, it, those letters gave gave you perhaps the confidence yes, that perhaps exactly. you yeah. should have had Crutch to anyway yeah. without them. Yeah. Yes, but the fact was that I didn't, See, and I'm, I'm perhaps I'm yeah. more isolated. Yeah, there were yeah. Lots of things. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, no. So you, you, you not doing the things that you didn't want to do um, is should be done through assertion, through, through your moral principle anyway it doesn't require some special uh, or, or or the the belief in a letter writing process that actually is more connected with with their illegitimate system. it's really calling them out under the constitutional law that they are meant to be bound by and by not doing that we're not exposing the truth yeah what you're actually doing is just going into their weird system well, and playing them at their own games with their own special letter writing. I was under the impression that this was a process that belongs in common law. Is that wrong? I don't. Well, I don't know what the letters were. Well, they called out the David. Maybe. Okay. Well, that could be. Yes, that could be. You know, it doesn't require you to, to go through a special letter writing process. This is what I was saying. It's just a plain <coughs> English thing. It could have been you picking up the phone and just saying, you know, what you are doing is unlawful. Yes, but Why? The, because of. But the difference is that I then have a document that I was led to believe I could show to someone. But that's your document, isn't it? No, it's a legally binding document. I'm under the impression.
Yeah. Because I've been through the process. I can talk to other people about it and say I've done this. And actually, it's much easier to talk about I don't about think there's anything binding on them on the common law to. I, I don't, I, no, I don't think that necessarily there's anything technical in that process that would either be binding on them. What's binding on them is the constitutional law. The fact that you've engaged in that letter writing process does not give you any safety because you initiated it. But, but if this lady sent an affidavit of fact and, the, uh, and the, it, she's sent the notice three times, uh, acquiescence is, for, uh, uh, it means if they don't respond, that is acquiescence and it gives her power. Yes, but the not responding is an admiralty thing. That kind of self-executing um, thing, the idea that I'm, make, I'm making some statements and if you don't rebut these in 30 days or whatever it is, then it carries through as well. What I've stated carries through. That's an admiralty thing. I, I, I believe that's, I don't think that's a common law thing at all. So I require a court to hear it, a common law court and a jury to hear it. So I don't think there's anything technical in those processes that would have given you the protection. It's just you asserting those principles which is what, what you were saying. And we should be talking about the fact that they, on the other side, are bound under constitution. And that's what we should be doing, because that's, that's the, the, the evidence for that is it's all over, all, all through our history of law. It's really quite clear. And so that, that's what we should be holding them to account under. Sorry, William. Yeah. This lady here. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. All I wanted to say was this lady is on her hero's journey, the same as we are. So if she's used Admiralty law and it's given her that boost of confidence, it's done what it needed to do on her journey. Yeah. Where the other lady and other people have had the innate confidence because their conscience and their spiritual awakening for whatever that means to people to decide for themselves mm -hmm. has given them the confidence to stand for what they really and truly believe is the right thing. Sure. So I, I I see where you've used it and I came very close to spending an eight amount of time following that process and then I stood a bit like a giant guy behind John. I stood mainly because I have got a strong Christian belief system uh, in Christ came to set us free, and I am a free person in the universe. And that's a different journey for me. So I think you're all right. I just think we're on different paths, but I think there is definitely natural law is where we all hopefully will find ourselves calling upon more. It's the lady here, William. Do you want to ask about Magna Carta, the original? to start with. Anything that follows after that, isn't that all legislation? Yes. And doesn't Parliament get its power from Magna Carta? And they can't revoke Magna Carta, otherwise they revoke themselves. They can't, they can't revoke 1215 Magna Carta, no. Because otherwise they revoke part. themselves and any power they stand on. It's not a statute, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Because correct. it's completely different. Yes. And as for the, the, the World Health Organization stuff, and anything to do with the European Union, isn't it all treasonous because it's giving away our sovereignty, Correct. which they do not have the right Absolutely to do? Right. Yes. So all we have to do is call them out as treasonous. Yes, correct. And I've got a lot of rope in my shed. <laughs> <laughs> to solve all our problems very quickly. Do you know that? Just need a big long drop well on one next leaf. Maybe I've got one of the drops on the rivers. We <laughs> probably haven't got, got enough rope. <laughs> 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 Well, yes, I, 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 I suppose I wrote a letter with Justin on that. Um, Did you ever get an answer to that letter? No. no. I mean, I haven't spoken to Justin for about three or four days, so I, I need to find out from him actually whether he's had anything. But no, I don't think so. Um, and interestingly, somebody else um, from from that. Um, well, let's, let's say a social equal of the Duke of Norfolk um, also wrote to him along the same lines and didn't get a response either. 
which is interesting because it's quite a lot of people. Uh, because everything in that letter was absolutely true, a absolutely straight down the line, uh, and it's very, very tricky. Like, I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I wasn't expecting an awful lot, to be honest. You know, because no. that's what they're really good at is just ignoring things. But um, it's going to go away. <laughs> it, it's, it, it is going to cause a, a constitutional crisis, I, I would say. Your head of state can't do that and not act under law at the same time. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So there is a contradiction, definitely. So what process is going to happen to put things right then? What do you think is going to happen? Hundreds of thousands and millions of people are going to get really weird about it. That's what's going to happen. If not, nothing will happen. Well, yeah. Sorry. And things will carry on. Yeah. So, yeah. I just want to say quickly, backing up what this lady said. Obviously, I've watched various videos of David Strait in America. Like, oh, David. Else. David Strait. Don't know. Right. It's worth looking at. It's, it's fantastic. Been involved with this. What we're all here about tonight for at least thirty years. Yeah. Um, to my mind, as again, I am a Christian. I gave my life to Jesus at nineteen years old. I'm now fifty-seven. When you melt all this down, what we're all talking about. The, the thing you have to remember is God gave man dominion over the earth. And that's all you need to think about. God accepts all this other rubbish that's going on, but what they're telling us is right. God gave man, as in mankind, it's not gender related. So God gave man dominion over the earth. And if you remember that, it empowers you. Yeah. That's how I feel empowered. Yeah. I'm saying that to myself every day. So yeah, nice thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Good. Yeah. Is that it? Fantastic. What an amazing audience. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I would just say for people that, um, you know, sorry if it sounds, it sounds a little bit, um, it doesn't sound part of the call, but I don't think anything will change until the things that I've talked about tonight are ever happen. You know, the, the, the Constitution is there to find them. They are the standards by which the other side is supposed to be. And if a huge number of people start to notice and understand it and start asking the questions and pointing that out publicly, it's going to get very difficult. And that will make a difference. Um, but uh, as I've said tonight in the second half, there's a much deeper aspect to all of this as well. And if that self-reflective part of the process doesn't happen, then you, you, you won't get that change. The universe will not deliver back the change and the transformation that you want. It won't happen. It's not a given. But it is up to us. And we could do it. Thank you, William. Thank you. Thank you.